But God, tonight, we want your face. We want you. We want to be a people of a holy habitation for you. that you meet the hungry, you feed the hungry. And God, you satisfy those who are thirsty. And I thank you tonight that the well is open. And this is a well, a place where people may drink. said amen 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 I tell you what Larry why don't you go ahead and uh, turn that music all the way down we're just going to leave it on tonight but I just kind of sense um, is everybody hearing me okay out there am I coming through the mic at a good level okay good because I didn't put anything in the monitors here which is fine I'm going to make sure you can hear me because if you can hear me out there that means it's going to pick up for the recording that we'll, we'll be getting uploaded to YouTube. And so, just wanna make a few quick announcements real quick. Uh, of course, this Sunday evening, we'll have our regular scheduled 5 p.m. service. Uh, intercession, hopefully to start around 4.30ish, if you wanna come in for that, we pray, like we did with the revival, that's gonna be a thing that God begins to operate. Wanna tell you that we will have live worship Jacqueline and Elijah are going to lead worship on Sunday evening. And I'll tell you that um, that they were, I was in Jacqueline's office last night, and they had Elijah's keyboard set up in my in our room, and Elijah.
Elijah or Jackson was trying, because she, she, back in the day, had a little bit of skill on the keys. So she was trying to resurrect some of that, and she wasn't too sure about it. Got Elijah in there, and Elijah just starts picking up stuff. Okay? So it's not quite polished. And it's not all, but let me tell you, when, when I heard them in there just practicing, even with hitting a wrong note, I felt the anointing hit me in the back of the head, wow. through the wall. So there's something there. So even though Josh and Bethany are, are taking care of themselves right now with um, little Miriam, and they're having that time as a family, God still got things in order, and so we'll see what the Lord turns over this Sunday night. Okay. So... Tonight, being the first service of the new year for this ministry, you know, I don't know everybody's background and, uh, you, know, you know, your background in church and stuff, but how many of you have ever been to these churches and they've got like this theme for the year? And every year they got a new theme, they got a new slogan, a new vision, yeah. that sort of thing. And uh, I know like last year, I feel like the Lord spoke to me about it being a year of work and warfare, and man, I'm... I'm, I'm ready to keep this warfare and this kickback season gone. Amen. But but I'm not really built that way, but I do want to tell you that God was putting some things in my heart for this next year, and it was confirmed through Brother Jonathan's ministry when he came. And so tonight I'm going to be talking about that thing. You're going to hear me talk probably about the same thing for an entire year to the point that if you don't you learn to hear by the Spirit and pick up in the Spirit, you might get sick of it and go look somewhere else. And if that's the case, then go look somewhere else. But I know this, that it takes time to build a culture. Pastor Matt Mueller, a good friend of mine, we were talking one time, and he says, Grady, I don't think your ministry at the Hub has become the thing yet, the thing it's supposed to become and I believe that. There's been a lot of weeding out. People have come, go, check us out, go somewhere else, whatever. But I know what the Holy Spirit has said for this year, and we are going to focus on that. So if you want to, and you actually need to, turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And I tell you, we're going to read, start reading in verse 1 and go through verse 6. And I'm going to break down some stuff for you. Are you ready to hear the word of the Lord for the year, for this ministry? Oh, yeah. Beginning in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 7 through verse 6. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not take notice or do not take notice of the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs. And do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And I want to read verse 6 again. Do not give what is holy to the dogs. Do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Father, give us understanding in all things. Reveal your word to us tonight. And what you are saying by your spirit, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So, there was a popular song that came out back in the 90s, I believe it was, by a guy named Tupac. Oh my. Okay. <laughs> Only God can judge me. Have you ever heard that? Okay. Can I tell you, there is technically some...
some truth, but the way he was portraying it was rightly dividing the word of truth. Because oftentimes you'll start talking to somebody about how what, the way they live and what happened. They get offended. You can't tell me, you can't tell me if that's a sin because only God can judge me. That's right. Well, I got news for you. If you cannot tell somebody that they're living wrong or what they're doing is not right, then how can anyone preach? Throughout the Old Testament. And even Jesus in the New Testament told people what they were doing was wrong. Well, Jesus was God, yes, but what about Isaiah? Before he said, woe is me in Isaiah 6, he called out, woe to this city, woe to this people. Well, he was rebuking and he was calling out the sin of the day. So when Jesus says, don't judge lest you be judged, he says, the measure in which you judge will be measured back to you. In other words, how you do project on people, that standard's going to be projected back to you. That's right. And so what Jesus is saying is not that you can't call out somebody's stuff, just make sure you're not doing the same stuff they are. Exactly. If you're going to confront somebody about adultery, make sure you're not committing adultery yourself. <laughs> if you're going to confront somebody about them stealing and robbing someone, you might want to look inside your heart and realize that them pins you're taking from the office that were paid by the company is just as much a way of theft. Come on. Okay. So what you so what Jesus is saying is before you call out the sin in someone else, first look in yourself. Make sure your eye is clear. Then you can go and confront your brother. Okay. It's a way of keeping you pure and making sure you're right. Because the Pharisee always points the finger but never looks inside first. So a word of warning by the Spirit of God and by those who will see this on YouTube, do not become the Pharisee. Because this whole thing I've talked about judging is really not the word of the Lord for the year. It's leading up to the word of the Lord for the year. Because if we do what Jesus says, we're going to an elevated place but you need to realize that you can't be looking through Come on. an unclean eye when you get to an elevated place. Otherwise, you will fall. Mm -hmm. Take heed lest anyone thinks he stand lest he fall. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is saying before you go bring correction, make sure everything's pure with you in that area first. Doesn't mean you've got to be sinless and perfect. But you need to make sure if you're going to confront somebody about thieving, adultery, whatever, you got to make sure that you have a clean slate first. Mm -hmm. So then Jesus, here in verse number 6, says something very interesting. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Mm -hmm. Do not throw your pearls before swine that will trample them under their feet and turn it tear you to pieces. Jesus, what does that got to do with judging folks? You have to understand context. Context means you can't just take one verse, make a doctrine. You've got to pull everything in together. So verse 6 falls within the context of verses 1 through 5. It's tied together. So how can throwing pearls before pigs and putting holy things before dogs be tied to judging folks and be tied to bringing correction to people? Because holy things are precious. Can I see your tallit, Sister Barbara? Okay, this tallit is not just a piece of cloth. It's a right. Jewish prayer shawl. You get up underneath this thing and you linger the fire of God to touch you in a way, in a such a way that you, you can't imagine without having it on your head. I'm telling you. Yeah. Here's just a piece of cloth. I put it on there and also I felt fire on my head. Yeah. And I smelled the aroma of heaven the first time I prayed in one of these. <laughs> I kid you not, I'm not making this up. True. But this is a holy thing. And you don't give this to a dog, much less. I mean, you you don't even give your sh shoes to the dog. The dog will chew up your shoe. <laughs> much less a holy thing like a prayer shawl. Yeah. 
Well, what about you ladies in your jewelry? You ain't gonna get no pig. Pigs don't value pearls. They don't value jewelry. Dogs don't even value your shoes. How much less will they value or honor something that's holy? And so what Jesus is saying is correction to people. It, correction is something that is precious. It is something that is holy. It is something that you only give to a people who will value or honor it. Yes. Yes, yes. How many times have you went to tell somebody the error of the way and they did not receive it? But only turn around and try to tear you to pieces by making you the bad guy. Yeah. That's what Jesus is talking about. Listen, there are people who need to be corrected, but there's some battles you do not want to fight because all they're going to do is turn on you, tear you to pieces. You don't have the grace to bring that correction. you got to know and discern who you can correct and who's got to just go on with their own pride, eat a little humble pie, and if they don't get them, they're probably going to die. Amen. Okay? So you have to understand you don't give that which is precious, holy, valuable to a people. Listen here. To a people who will not honor it. Okay. If Jesus, hear this, please, hear this, please. You're going to hear it more and more and more. You might hear the same thing Sunday night. And the reason why is many of us are hearing it here, but we don't know how to hear it in here yet. Mm -hmm. We're hearing it here, but we ain't got it here. You know how I know? Because I've been preaching this in this building. Now somebody's getting, somebody remembers. Okay? Even back at Lake Hamilton. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how God allows revelation to compound for a future season. Yes. So you don't give that which is valuable to a people who will not honor it. Mm -hmm. If God instructs us to not give that which is valuable or precious or holy to a people who will not value it, then how much more will God not do that himself? I gotta say that again. It went right over the rooftop with some folks. If God commands us to not give that which is valuable, precious, holy to people who will not honor it, then how much more will God not do that himself? Why? Have we not experienced the fullness of what we've cried out for? Come on. Because God will not pour out the preciousness of the spirit of revival to a people who do not fully know how to honor it. Yes, that's right. This year, what I heard the Lord say is you need to teach and to preach on creating a culture of honoring the presence of God. When I was traveling full time, I would open up services by saying that, you know, money is the currency of the earth, and everybody thought I was about to take up another offering. <laughs> and I would say, but I'm not about to take up an offering because money, you got to have money to make pay rent. It's the currency of the earth. It's what makes the world go around, the economy. Yeah. God, you don't have money. You can't, you can't get into the currency, the things that shift and move the earth. But I taught people that something was the currency of heaven. I said, honor is the currency of heaven. Mm -hmm. And I would immediately go to honor the pastor who was having me preach. I would honor him and bless him and thank him because I wanted the currency to heaven to flow in the meetings, and I missed something because I came from a system that taught honoring leadership. And let me tell you, you should honor leadership. But it's got to go further than that. You have to learn to honor his presence. Yes. Oh. When you honor the presence, there's a fear of the Lord that comes with it. There is a seriousness that comes with it. Too much of 
the church world today is too casual when it comes to the presence of God. Jesus said this. You can't put new wine into an old wineskin. We've, we've been taught that the old wineskin was the old way, the faint way we sang songs 50 years ago. That is not what that means. It, it might be tied to what it means. There's a reason why the same hymns, I believe, were sung for so long because when a new sound began to be released, people rejected it mm -hmm. and couldn't recognize the new sound that heaven was releasing into the earth. Yes. Let me tell you, Elvis Presley's sound was rejected by the church. Yes, it was. Jerry Lee Lewis, mm -hmm. the sound he... And some of y'all are way too young probably to know who that is. I barely know who it is only because I've known and heard it myself. <laughs> but there are people that they said, man, they just play that boogie woogie. We don't need that up in the church. And they were releasing a fresh sound. They were actually hearing a sound, a gift thing they had to release a fresh sound, and the church rejected it. Yeah. So here's what you need to know is that when you have intimacy, an old wineskin doesn't mean you're just old by age. An old wineskin was a wineskin that was not kept fresh by applying oil to the wineskin. Yes. The wineskin could stay soft and pliable. It could expand with every new season of wine that was put into it if it was kept soft and pliable by the oil. Yeah. And the believer, the church, the body of Christ has failed to let the oil of intimacy be applied so it could expand with the new thing that heaven was pouring out. There are people who are staying in religious structures and systems and denominations, and they're staying at that church, they're staying at that place, and they're praying for God to pour out his spirit and let revival happen in that old wineskin. And let me tell you, it is a waste of time to cry out in that system. Why? Because Jesus said, if Jesus said you don't put old wine into new wine, or, uh, new wine into old wine skins, and we're not supposed to do that, then how much more will He not? Yeah. That's right. Because if we, if God gave into that system what we cried out for, it would be wasted. It would actually bring destruction to some wine skins that were good, well-meaning wine skins. Mm. Many people who are in a religious system in an old wine skin, they're well-meaning people. They're not hell-bent. They're not trying to do things the wrong way. They're just caught in an old system. And here's what happened is people in those systems will get a small taste of new wine every once in a while in that old wine skin. And what will happen is you'll get a taste and you'll think, man, it's finally getting better. What I prayed for, I got a taste. And then you go several months later and then you finally get another little taste. A few months later, and then and you just like it gets you drug along. It's like the enemy almost, and almost the religious system under the religious spirit. It gives you just a little bit of taste of what you long for, yeah, that's good, that's good. and it keeps you in bondage. But you'll never have the fullness because that system does not have an honor system for the presence of God True. in its fullness. That's why there's some places, there's well-meaning, God-fearing people, but there ain't no way that they're going to let any speaking in tongues go on in their church. Yeah. Why? Because they don't honor that, and God will not pour it out. Not being demeaning. The, like the Baptist church brought the message of salvation to me. I was called to preach while I was in that system. God was breathing fresh. Listen, I got filled with the spirit in that system. And then when I got asked to preach in my Baptist youth group, and I laid hands on everybody and spoke in tongues, they realized something done happened to Grady. 
With, I heard he was going to some of these Pentecostal tent revivals in some of these other churches. And, but, but, some that have, but they don't realize is I spoke in tongues before I went to a Pentecostal service. Yes, sir. I left one of their services. I left one of their system meetings. Got in my truck. The Holy Spirit filled me. Why? Because I was hungry. I was thirsty. God gave me. My heart cried. So guess what? They didn't let me preach no more. But I stayed for a while. Well, I wanted to honor it. It was a place I was familiar with. Maybe God will break out and do something, but God never did. And to this day, still not, has not. And I know many people that stayed and prayed and went up there and anoint the pulpit with oil and anoint the doors. They were allowed to go have a prayer meeting. And it's still the same today. Why? Did God not hear the prayer? I'm telling you, the old wineskin. God, actually, it was not God's will to pour out his spirit because the system there would not with, could not contain that. Sure. That's why God will pull people out of those systems. And so here, some of you know what I'm talking about. Because you're, you're, God's pulling you out or has pulled you out. But this is what you need to know. If you are not careful, if you are not careful, you will become the very thing that you hate. That's true. The religious system. Mm -hmm. If you're not careful, you will become the we will become the system that we all left. Mm -hmm. What creates the religious system? When you fail to honor the presence of God. I want to say, when you begin to honor people above presence, the religious system is knocking on the door. Because the Pharisees, what Jesus said, they honor one another and they come in when they got their garments on and they make their long prayers and get honor from one another. I would go to certain minister meetings and they would see me and well, you, how you, you use pastor him. Well, how many are you running? One to measure up. See, we had to speak evangelistically when you only had five, but you told me you at least had 15. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. And we'd honor, we'd bless, and we'd buddy up and rub shoulders. They would rub shoulders and all this stuff. And the whole time is about how many you were running. Not who you were hosting. True. Listen, I would really love to have some rear ends in these seats. But not at the expense of not creating a place to honor the presence. I was talking, had a phone conversation earlier today with Evangelist Dustin Hedrick. And when I told him what God put on my heart. He interrupted me, so I got to tell you what God's been speaking to me. It's the same thing. Yeah. Good. 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 To honor the presence. Mm -hmm. Hosting him, honoring him, facilitating a thing where we realize the holiness of God. Mm -hmm. The seriousness. Can I tell you? that when when I was a kid if if I moved an inch if my eyebrow quivered my dad was going to get me <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about But I'm also not talking about that we're so casual that we can sit there and scroll on the phone while the glory's being poured out. Yes. I hate using the word balance, but there's a there's a balance in that. And you know, I've seen also I've seen where God was pouring out his spirit in revival. God's using somebody power work, glory's being poured out in worship, and somebody sit down in the front row. And pop open a soda can. 
in the service. And let me tell you, in case anybody doesn't know, except for the kids that have snacks and stuff, but you know you're not supposed to bring any outside food or drink except water in here? Y'all know that's a that's rule? True. Did y'all know that's something we've had on the slides before, but nobody pays attention to it? I don't really say anything. Why do we have that rule? Because you're going to go to hell? Yeah, you're going to go to hell if you bring a soda pop in the yard. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Number one, people spill, and we had ants in here like you wouldn't believe. And number two, if you need, let's, we have long services, and if you need to hydrate, drink you some water. Yeah. yeah. Amen? Amen. Right. Amen. And if you're really that hungry, I mean, if you got to eat a few one, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when, the, when the offering's being took up, you drop your offering and just go step outside and cram that peanut butter bar down your throat. Yeah. <laughs> you, two, three bites, it's over with. You got time to do that. Hello, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, we can talk about it here, but let me tell you, in my past season in ministry, remember my first church I youth pastor? My pastor, Brother Bland, would talk about it from the pulpit. People would sit there near service. Announcements would go on, and offerings probably take about 10 minutes to do all that. The pastor would open up to start preaching, and somebody's cell phone would start going off. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> mistakes happen. I'm not talking about mistakes happen. Okay? Sometimes there's things that oversight happen. I'm not talking about that was not a dishonoring moment. It just happened. Didn't know your alarm was off. The time to eat, you got a few. Oh, anyway. All right. <laughs> okay? However, let's get back to the serious moment. But the pastor would open up to start preaching. I kid you not, two or three people would get up to go to the bathroom. You didn't bring no offering, no way. You ain't paying attention to the announcements. You know how I know? Because they'd call me to find out what was going on the next week. So they ain't bringing no offering. They're not paying the tithes. And they're not paying attention to the, to the announcements. But as soon as the word gets on, you got to get up and go to the bathroom. What was it? I'm not saying if you get up to go to the bathroom. you got to go to the bathroom. Don't sit there and pee on the chair, okay? But what I'm saying is our framework of mind has to be that we don't want to miss the moment when God's about to pour out glory or about to speak his word. And so we've got to shift our heart posture to think that when we come here, what's our agenda? It's going after the presence of God. So what obstacle might be in the way? For me not to do it. Listen, guys, we have long services. Yeah. Yeah. Not saying you're sitting there and you're afraid I'm going to call you down from the pulpit because you got to go to the bathroom where your phone goes off, whatever. I just, I had to mess with you. Oh, I love I you, girl. <laughs> it's so fun. You know how, you know, there's, you ever heard of the book called The Five Lang Love Languages? Oh, yeah. yeah. They missed one. There's a sixth one. Oh, it's mine. It's picking on people. It's how I show people I love you. <laughs> Don't get any ideas, Larry. I picked one <laughs> right. But our heart has to shift to where we honor presence. I want to say this with the right heart and attitude. But we are not here for people. People being ministered to, I believe, will be a natural byproduct of ministering unto the Holy Spirit. Unto the Holy Spirit. And then from that place can ministry take place. When I was going to school with SUM, it was required of us to be able to graduate to go to the Mardi Gras outreach and preach on Bourbon Street with the school. I had to spend two trimesters in the, in the, at the end of the winter trimester. Maybe it was the beginning of the spring. I think it was the end of the winter trimester. Yeah, trimesters. And we would go about February, March, and we'd go down to Bourbon Street 
several hundred, bur 700 Bible college students, and we would preach on Bourbon Street. Who else am I going to call down from the pulpit? <laughs> Probably Larry. <laughs> Remember I said about loving you, Larry? I'm taking it back. Yeah. <laughs> no, but before we would go out to preach and evangelize, do you know what we spent like an hour and a half doing? What we did tonight. Yeah. We would minister unto the Lord. Then we would get into this prophetic drumbeat warfare. We'd start interceding. And, you know, when we started walking, because you couldn't drive to Bourbon Street. You had to walk like a couple miles to get there. Wow. And it's almost like the anointing that was on you, you could feel it rising up. Because wow. you also feel that darkness rising up. Wow. And it's just like, we're going to war. We'd penetrate that darkness. And we'd see people get saved, people sober. Yeah. We'd see people filled with the Holy Spirit wow. right there on Bourbon Street. Why? Because we took fir first things first. I mean, minister unto the Lord. I remember when the Lord called me to start this. He said, throw the clock out the window. Be a place that's about my presence. That has not changed. Let me challenge you with something. What did Jesus say for us to do? Did he say for us to evangelize the world or make disciples? You can't make a disciple until you get a convert, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So which is more important, discipleship or evangelism? Why? Why would make us say that? Because my whole life I've been told evangelism, and I am and was an evangelist. I mean, for crying out loud, two times a year I preach the same salvation message as an outreach on a Friday night. In youth ministry, I saw more kids saved from that one message than any other message I've ever preached in my life. So what, how can discipleship be more important? This is why. Because for so long we've been about winning the souls when we had no discipleship. And this is why there's a danger in that. Because Jesus, when he talked to the Pharisees, I'm not saying don't go evangelize. Go down the street and go preach the gospel. Go for it. Do it. I'm for it. I'm all for it will never dissuade you. But here's what you need to understand. Jesus, when he would talk to the Pharisees, he told the Pharisees this. You'll travel land and sea to the ends of the earth to make one convert. That's right. But you'll make them twice a son of hell as you are. Did you catch what Jesus told the Pharisees? The Pharisees were evangelistic. They will go to the ends of the earth to take their message. And when a convert, and Jesus said, but you're going to make them twice a son of hell as you are. Oh, wow. In other words, you will reproduce in them who you are. Yeah. Who did the Pharisees become? They became the religious system. It was all about them and their kingdom. And the way you stay away from that error is you become only what you behold. What you meant, what you honor. Mm -hmm. So if we can get this right, then you know we start putting souls on the street and they start coming in here. Then, because I remember the Lord spoke to me a couple years ago. I was going to preach for Pastor Mike Mason at the assembly, and the Lord was giving this word about intimacy. And I remember the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, if you make converts. Outside of the intimacy of revival, you will make them twice a son of hell as you are. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to exhibit my heart quick. Because he was checking me that I didn't honor the wrong thing. It's presence before people. A hundred percent of the time. Right now, everybody's making about people. Get people, get the crowd, get the crowd, get the crowd. Jesus had a crowd and preached a message that picked them off. And thousands left. But he had 12 that learned to honor the presence. They waited on it in an upper room. The Holy Spirit fell. And those 12 men, plus the other 108 that stayed with them, the full 120, honored the presence of God. And those people who had an encounter turned the world upside down because of honoring the presence of God. 
when you come here, when we gather, every single eye has to be on the presence of God. Can I just address some things freely here tonight? Okay, can I just speak without offending anybody, without pointing fingers, without not coming with this 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 sword to cut you in the jugular? Okay, I'm gonna leave that for Sister Jacqueline. Amen. <laughs> he heard that. She probably did. I felt, man, I felt the air hit me in the back. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that's the name on the television. He said that you was a witchcraft lady. You said the air is just like. Anyway, there's a teaching about, anyway, fire y'all tell us. Go that. Maybe next year. We're going to honor the presence first. Y'all done messed me up and I done forgot what I was going to say now. Okay. Yeah, I'm not a fancy people. Okay. I love it when we have visitors. But do not leave your place of encounter to go hug the neck of somebody you're so excited to see. That they actually came because you invited them. Yeah. Somebody said, oh, who did that? Oh, they got somebody. <laughs> oh, you're back. It's some fiery darts again. We find that in Jesus' name. We don't have, see, we have fun in the presence of God. But I'm here to tell you, but this is because I've seen this. I've seen this when I travel. Where people would leave a place of encounter to go make sure they shook hands with somebody, loved them, like welcome. And yeah, I'm all for that. But don't lose your moment because you disengaged with him to make sure that somebody isn't offended. We're, listen, God will take care of them. Yes. Your pull on heaven and your encounter may be what arrests their soul. Yes. That's good. That's, that's, good, yeah. that's, that's the heartbeat. It's got to be him. And I felt, you know, if they leave because we didn't get up to go welcome them, then they weren't ours to keep here anyway. They're not ready for this That's yet. That's the truth. Yeah. That's the truth. But they're a lost soul. They might be. But I trust God in his sovereignty and his power to work what he needs to work without letting somebody come in to be a distraction from what the culture we're trying to build. It's him first. I sent some of y'all a video. Isaiah Saldivar. Yes. He said they're offering people donuts, and I preach against the donuts and coffee. I got a coffee maker in there. Every day I get delivered. Had some before. Serves a couple cups, probably two in. Advertise. Yeah. Come to the hub, get a free cup of coffee from Brother Grady's coffee maker. We are blessed to have the facility we have, but we don't have the greatest, grandest facility. It's perfect for us. But it's perfect for us. It's, it's just Jesus. Yeah. It's God, is, God is here. God meets us here. It's yeah. his ordained yeah. place for us. So how do we promote? We just give people God. We give them the presence of God. When back before this morning was down, we had this stage and we were having our secret meetings, I said a statement that we're all called to carry this. How? By honoring the presence of Jesus. If we learn to all, if a corporate body gets in unity to host the presence of Jesus every single time and keep that fervency and keep going after him, everything else takes care of itself. Because we can deviate from that. We can get people by deviating from that. I don't know what time it is. Y'all got time for another story? Sure. More, more. So, some of you may have, may have heard me talk about this. And I don't want to elevate what God did yesterday because the glory of the latter will be greater than the former. But what God did teach me in a previous season, I was a youth pastor at Lake Hamilton Assembly. Hey, Sunday. Nice to deny the phone. Hey, I love you. Bless you, sister. She's walking out, too. <laughs> she listened to the sermon. When you repented Y'all get on, I'm going to host Jesus. Listen, everybody left here, and when nobody here, I think I would just keep the space for the office because Jesus meets me in there. Yeah. 
I'm up there trying to do stuff that ain't even Jesus related. Here's Jesus right to the side. Right there, right there. He meets me here greater than he meets me at my house. And Jesus is at my house. But I was youth pastor at Lake Hamilton Assembly. We started a youth ministry service on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and you know you're supposed to be down about 8. But my friend Josh Renard was my worship leader. And God would start breathing upon him, and kids would start coming to the altar, and then I might not get to start preaching about 745. I'd wrap it about 815. Kids come back to the altar, and we're staying right to 830, we're we gotta get them on the bus because we gotta get them home, you know, their parents, all this stuff. And sometimes it's 8.45, so we're having like this hour and 45 minute worship yeah. service. And so I know it's like, we gotta get these kids home, you know. And I mean, people are bringing my kids who were in the nursery at that time. Nursery workers come in and hand me the kid going, Here, while I'm in there in the prayer line praying for kids. They're mad because the service went over. People, the Holy Ghost is blowing on people. And people getting mad. Anyway. Oh it only happened like one time, but they. They made it evident. Here. So, and I believe they love me and I do honor them, but that moment they had enough because it's been going on forever. So, we came up with this plan. Why don't you start a start at 6.30? That way it could end around 8. And that way even it goes a little old and we still get kids out at 8.15 or so. Listen, kids, I, we're doing good to get sometimes in the van. At 845, I asked old Josh Renard, ask my wife. Ask. God did it. We rent two vans. Not only the teenagers, but even the younger grade school kids. They had their class and they're getting home later. But God worked it all out. God moved. But let me tell you what began to happen is I went through this season where I did this competition. You brought so many people. If you gave any amount of offering, you got so many points and you could have won a like a PSP and some other stuff. We had this like contest of like, you know, let's, you know, be faithful, come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, you get so many points, all this stuff. And got up to about 25 kids for a Wednesday night. I was so excited. We had more than 15, 10. Guess what happened to all them kids once the competition was got over? Yeah. Now God was still moving, God was still breathing by his spirit. But I remember when the Holy Spirit gave me this dream, and I won't go into what the dream was, but it showed me that because I operated by the flesh, it was, there was a picture of me fishing. I was fishing this dream, and I'd get a bite, and every time I'd pull to get the fish out, the bait was gone. There was no hook. Mm -hmm. And God was showing me that the bait, after, as the bait that I was using actually represented the arm of the flesh, and they would take the bite, but there was no hook. There was no hook. And so, I went back to just relying on presence. Me and Josh Renard would have a Tuesday night prayer meeting. He'd come home. He would be on his way home from work at the Hibbit Sports, and we would pray over that youth room for like two and a half hours every Tuesday night. I would spend three, usually about three hours a day praying over that youth room every day for that Wednesday night service, just hosting presence. I can remember... When presence was all it was about, we far exceeded that 25 number that was used to bring in kids from the arm of the flesh. We started having 40 on a regular basis. The last Friday night prior we did, I did that message I preached. I don't know, probably this time it's the sixth or seventh time I preached it. It was called From the Coke Can to the Cross. I used the Coke Can to prove how God exists. I'd preach on sin, I'd preach on hell, and I'd preach the cross. We had 105 kids that last Friday night. Wow. Fire we did. May the 6th of 2011, 55 kids responded to that altar call that night. We had a black floor. We stained the floor black. We had black walls in our youth ministry called Fire Hall. We had orange flames planted on the wall. We had, you know... Bible verses about the fire painted on the wall. It's all dim. It was the coolest youth room. They said it looked like hell, but I was snatching kids out of hell. Yeah. And I remember those 55 kids was up there praying to receive Christ, and when they went to sit down, it looked like somebody took a mop and just left a wet streak where all those kids were standing because of the tears. What made the difference? The presence of God grew that day. Yeah. Now, 
tell you, you want people to get ministered to? Yes. But you got to get presence right first. We have to learn to honor. To create this culture. Some of you, you know, can't hardly keep up with what's going on when we're meeting here. You know, and maybe that's by the Lord's design because what if God's spirit begins to flow and all of a sudden our service times change, days change, the way we do things change. I know a place that totally scrapped their Sunday service. They can meet on Friday night. I'm not saying it's what's going to happen, but I'm just saying you've got to be a people that, just like with when Brother Johnson was here and we scrapped our uh, Christmas party. My wife bought a lot of food for that, and we had to eat it. I think some of it she froze. We'll save it for next year, amen. But what happened? The Holy Spirit was breathing upon it different. What, what place do you know was canceled their ministry Christmas party? Them service. us. That's what I'm saying is we have to learn to honor that and be willing to move and shift. We do it. We start on Sunday nights. It's the only service to have. Then we had Sunday morning and Sunday night. Then we didn't have worship for a year. We went back to having worship. We went back to Sunday nights and a Thursday night. What in the world's going on? I don't know. You tell me. When you get it figured out, let me know. <laughs> but all I know to do is try to honor what he says. Yeah. That's what we are all called to help facilitate and create. True. Do not give what is holy to the dog. Do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Almost every season of ministry I have from the Baptist days when I didn't know no better to my youth pastorate days a ministry time I spent at Teen Challenge to traveling almost every phase I saw the resistance and the lack of honor to the moving of the Holy Spirit. And if I wanted to preach and lead and speak to a people that would not honor that type of move, I would go back to what I was doing before. God didn't call me to start this to become that. You are going to hear this, not necessarily what I, everything I said tonight over again, because I ain't have notes, y'all. I'm speaking by the Spirit of God tonight. So I'm going to be like a butterfly carried by the wind. But this is it. This is who we got to become. It's got to be laser focused. We have to. This is it. Yeah. It's Jesus. It is nothing but Jesus. Nothing but his presence. Nothing but his presence. And Larry, why don't you just turn up some of that music just a little bit. We're going to see what the Lord wants us to do tonight. Just engage your heart.
about some things that I've seen. And I want you to know, if you've been ever participate or done some of those things that might have brought a dishonor, a dishonor to the Holy Spirit, I want you to be free from condemnation tonight. Because some things we just don't know. We have to learn to be taught. Just like these kids. Bless these kids, Lord. These kids are doing so well tonight. They're being kids, but they are honoring Jesus tonight. Mm. <laughs> we have to learn, just like they got to learn. We're bigger kids, whether you realize it or not. We've got to learn. And the, God is going to teach us more about this honor thing. There's things that we're going to see that we didn't see before. We're going to be like, man, God, I want to honor you now. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to bring my posture to this place again like that. Lord, I'm sorry that I honor you. The Holy Spirit is giving us an invitation to go on a journey with Him. And to a place, do things that eye has not seen and ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man. But may we receive and be a manifestation of the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Spirit be our teacher when we gather corporately. Be our teacher when we sit with you individually. Lord, be our teacher even in the night through visions and even dreams, God. Lord, be our teacher. Lord, use our day in and day out to teach us your way. Speak to our lives. The illustrations you put before us, give us the clarity to see in another realm to hear in another realm. by the Spirit, but I'm telling you right now, there's a clash that's going to happen with the religious spirit this year, like he said. I saw it in a conversation with somebody yesterday. They weren't trying to be combative, but I saw the spirit that was on them and the spirit that really in bondage, that religious spirit, clashing and trying to combat what God was speaking to me about this next year. I'm telling you, this right here, this honor thing, going to cause a clash. You're going to have people that you're going to tell them about and they're not going to understand. It's a clash. It's a clash. And I feel like the Lord is showing me that just like two warriors going to battle when they, they wield their sword and their swords kind of clash come into contact I don't know if it's been in a sword fight or really a battle but when you are engaged in some sort of combat and you have a loud noise come like that proximity it can shake the inside of your core it can get in your spirit in an intense moment but you can't back down when that religious spirit, and that clash, you have to keep your fervency and honor the presence of God. When they tell you you're wasting time, when they tell you that time is short, you got to get out there and do something. When God asks you to sit, you sit. I guarantee if you sit like that, that upper room, they sat. They came out with power. They came out with revelation. Peter came out with a prophetic word that cut to people's heart. Can you trust God so much and honor him in 
such a way and to such a degree that he will keep people alive until he releases you to preach that message. It's an honor him. You honor him, he'll take care of it. Teach us, O oh Lord, to honor your presence. This year, let us go over the mountain. Let us go over the ridge top. I see like this ridge, this mountain, this wall. And we're not able to see beyond the wall, like a veil, a wall, a mountain, a ledge, something, a ridge top. God, give us the eyesight to see through and beyond into that realm. Whatever veil has been put over us by religion, by man, by past experience, by trauma, the, the veil, the hindrance, the obstacle that has been placed in front of our spiritual sight by trauma, Lord, tonight let it be torn down and let us see beyond that thing into another realm. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I just right now, I come against the enemy and I cut to pieces the snare of fear. The snare of fear of leadership. The snare of fear of making a mistake, of misstepping in this house. I cut to pieces that snare. She cut a bosoplapa. She just press into that. Some of you got rise, you just press into that.
birthing you, giving you an anointing, an anointing to hear me clearly with the Lord. It is in the sense of prophecy, but even more in intimate, says the Lord. Intimate for my body, for my chosen ones. Be not afraid. Be not consumed unless I consume you. It is a serious thing. Search out. Search me. Search yourself. And when the time is ready for birth, you will know it. And it will come forth. And it will bring joy. And it will bring healing. in Jesus name the Lord showed me a picture of you tonight Andy it's like my daughter she was talking clearly at one and a half years old people were amazed at how clearly she could talk she would talk to her brother while her brother was in the womb saying his name speaking to him just as clear as I'm speaking to you now. And I heard the Lord, it's weird, it's like I heard and I saw the Lord say that in your life there will be an escalated growth. And he's going to give you a voice way before when most would think that you would have it. And I feel like the Lord just kind of prompted me to share this with you because it's going to happen fast. You're almost going to not be ready for it. Like you're going to feel like you're not ready for this. But it's going to happen quick. And I also 
saw this light. Like the Lord saying, like, you're going to realize you have to, God's going to draw you like into like a, like God's going to pull on you to like linger a little longer. Like anytime you feel like you're in prayer, or you're with the Lord, like I feel like the Lord want me to tell you, like hesitate before you think you need to leave. It's like you feel like the Lord's released you. Just take a second look to see if there's like another place he wants to pull you. Don't be so quick to leave that place of prayer and presence. Because it's what's going to keep you humble. Because the danger and the enemy's going to try to come and fill you and try to like get you to become inflated because of how he's how fast he's accelerated you. And that religious spirit's going to challenge that acceleration. And you just got to learn to linger and let the Lord. The Lord just allow you to walk in the humility that He's given you. And it's gonna happen real quick. It's coming, it's now. Just learn to stay in secret. Hesitate. Do it. You know, Lot's wife, she looked back and got to a pillar of salt because she looked to her previous season. God almost wants you to take a look back so you stay in his presence a little longer. When you feel like you're done, push past that doneness and you might find that another wave and dimension of glory is there on the other side. And I feel like there's people in here that have the word for this entire place. Double back. Take another look.
to speak a word now to everybody in here about your destiny this year. your place. Don't worry about preaching, speaking. Now, all, everybody wants to, everybody seems to think destiny has to be with this. It's hosting his presence. This is, this is what we're all called. When you come in and you host the presence of God, you fulfill your destiny. Amen. Not only this year, but your life and everything else that might be beyond that will happen as a result from that place. This year we'll teach on the power of creating the atmosphere and things like that, but it happens from hosting and honoring the presence. And tonight, he has met us, but there's more. There's more. There's more. Lord, I thank you that you're with your people. Thank you tonight for the kiss of heaven we have had. I thank you for the fanning of the flame. The application of the oil to the wine. And God, may we not become so calm with you that we get into a place of not take for granted the kiss in your presence.